There you go. Sorry, Randy. Good morning. All right, we're going to try that again because I think some of you fell asleep. Good morning. Rodney, that was wonderful you sharing with us this morning. I know we all appreciate it. Sharing your heart. And, uh, you know, when you're vulnerable before people, you risk being criticized. Trust me, I'm aware of that. And, uh, and Steve shares with us every week, and he's sitting in our service this morning. Steve, we appreciate you and Patty also and all you do around here. I, I, uh, I got to know Steve and Patty because they were our snow people for our Christmas Eve services and, and went above and beyond. You know, when I meet somebody and I give them a task and then they go above and beyond, I go, okay, pay attention because those are, because you know, there's a lot of 90% people in the world. You give them a task, and then you have to go finish it. You know what I'm talking about? And maybe, you had a, maybe you had a builder recently at your house. But anyway, my dad was a 100 percenter, and that's always good. All right, today we're going to talk about setting priorities, and I want to read the verse for the series, and here it is. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So Paul said, I have a goal. What's my goal? So today we're going to talk about this idea of discovering our priorities. And here's the thing. Um, Judges chapter 7. Let me tell you the whole story because last night, I because I break the story up and I had several people last night say to me, we kind of lost you about the story. We caught up at the end, but we didn't know. So let me tell you the story of Gideon. If you don't know, uh, it's in Judges chapter 7. And I would encourage you, listen, Judges is a kind of a fun book and a little a freaky book. There's some wild stories in there too. Judges chapter 7, though, really neat story about a guy named Gideon. If you've ever heard of the Gideons or the Gideon Bible, if you look on the Gideon Bible, there's a little torch and a little pitcher on the torch. The torch is coming out of the pitcher, and this is why their symbol is that way. So Gideon, basically God has called him to take out this group called the Midianites, who is camped and going to attack them. And so uh, uh, Gideon's nervous, and... Uh, um, God gives him 30, I think it's 36,000 men show up. And God says, that's too many. He says, tell anybody who wants to go home, they're scared, they, they miss their puppy, you know, whatever, you can go home. So a bunch of them go home, and God says, still too many. So then he sends them down to drink water, and basically, and we'll talk about this part of the story, the way they drink water, God says, send those guys home who didn't drink this way. They end up with three Hundred. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm taking somebody on, more is better, right? But that's not the way God works. God says, you need to trust me in the middle. Well, Gideon's still nervous, so God sends him outside the camp to listen, and he overhears somebody talking about a bad dream they had, which was basically a prophecy of what God was getting ready to do. It made Gideon bold. So Gideon goes back, tells the man, I have this great plan for attack, and I'm sure uh, by this time the guys are thinking, this is going to be a great plan. And I'm sure it's exactly how the Israelites felt when Moses said, we're going to, or when uh, uh, Moses' uh, brother said, we're going to march around the city, right? And so uh, he says, uh, he says, I got this great plan. We're going to get pitchers, torches, and trumpets. So they had a collection. So they gave each of them. By the way, if you're holding a pitcher, a torch, and a trumpet, you can't hold a sword, Right? And so their plan was that they would, they would break into groups of 100 on three sides of this, this uh, valley. And so that's what they did. They broke the pitcher, shattered in the Hebrew, uh, and they held up the, the torch, and they blew the trumpets, and they said, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon, which is really ironic because they didn't have swords with them. And the guys came out of their tents and began stabbing each other. And then ran off, and then the attack began. Okay, so there's the whole story from beginning to end. And then I'm going to talk about it piece by piece by piece. And hopefully I didn't bore you with my story. I already put Ernie to sleep. It didn't take long. It didn't take long. So this week, I did a little building at my house. And since we're doing renovation, I want to give you a little construction illustration every week. This is not my ladder. So actually, I found out it was David's ladder. He left it at the church. But anyway, so we get to use it when he does. So this week, I ordered. It was awesome. It was on uh, Amazon. It was a little overhang. I needed an overhang for the porch. And I had already put up a hillbilly overhang. You know what a hillbilly overhang is? It's a tarp, and you use bungee cords. Okay? So I did that, but I just every time I looked at it, I thought, Eric, you look like you're from Georgia, where your family's from. Uh, that's where uh, my grandfather was born in Milledgeville, Georgia, 
where the insane asylum is. If that should give you some insight into my life, he actually helped build the insane asylum. And then he moved to Miami in the 1920s, uh, before 1920s, and put sand on Miami Beach. So we've been there that long. And so I looked, and I couldn't stand anymore. So I bought this it really inexpensive overhang, but it looked great. And I read about it and looked it up. So I got it all planned. So I'm going to show you a couple pictures of me putting it together. So here's, it's not, no, none of me, but the, I read, hey, you ought to tape it, you know, with some blue tape so you can take it off to, to kind of hold it together while you're putting it up. Now there's three sections like this with brackets in the middle. And here it is kind of put together here and getting ready. And so then my, my plan was, because in the instructions it says, put them all together on the ground and then attach them. So I got them and I began carrying the this up the ladder. Now I'm on the second floor. So this is really exciting. And those of you who don't know, I'm afraid of heights already. So I'm carrying it. And as I get to the top, I put it on the wall. I get my bolt. You should see I, I'm using my feet to hand me stuff at this point. I start to get the first bolt in and the whole thing breaks apart. So here's the pictures of the breaking apart. Very exciting. Now, I have options now. Today, today. And here they are. Throw it in the garbage, call somebody, and have them do it. But I'm just stubborn enough that that is not what's happening. Now, Carl, don't worry. You don't have to come over for this one. There's a couple of times that Carl's heard my stories, and he said, I'm coming over before you lose a limb. But what I am going to do, I've, I've made a new plan. And my priority now is to get the first bracket hung. And then put the other pieces in and hang a bracket at a time. I'm also going to get the largest bolts I can find to make my life easier. Well, I shouldn't say I can find because I can probably find some that you use for giant things. So what did I do? I had a priority to hang this up and it didn't work. So I had to restart and rethink and refigure it out. Listen, if you and I, especially gentlemen, you listen to me. If we thought as much about our relationship with God as we did about the projects in our house, it would change our lives. If we began to think about our time in prayer, our time of walking with God, our prayer for other people as much as we thought about the different things we need to get done, it would change our lives. Ladies, that's true for you too. We've all had those moments in our lives that we've had to reevaluate, no matter what our project was, what we were doing, and we had to decide our priorities. And this week of all weeks should be a time that we all evaluate what are our priorities? What really is important to me? What really matters? So let's look at that today. Number one. So this is when we discover our priorities. And you could put when. Security and expectations change. We're picking up in Judges chapter 7, verse 4 through 8, the story that I told, and here we go. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. And I'm going to come back to what the Hebrew says there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one will not go with you, he shall not go. So, Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as dogs lap from those who kneel down to drink. Apparently God likes dogs that lap. 300 of them drank from cups' hands, lapping like dogs. Right? All the rest got down on their knees to drink. By the way, I have a theory. The Urkels, and the big guys, the Shaquille O'Neal's of the group, <laughs> my theory is that a lot of the big guys went home. And Gideon looked around and went, what? It's okay, Gideon, we got this. Don't you worry. We are ready, Right? The Sheldons of the world were the ones that were left. The ones who didn't want to get dirty. And the ones that were in a hurry got down. The Lord said to Gideon, 
with 300 men that I lapped, I will save you and give you the Midianites into your hand. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept 300 who took over, I love this, the provisions and the trumpets of the others. Because, you know, trumpets, required equipment in battle. They went from 32,000, the size of a city, to 300. Why? That's what God wanted. Now, let me go back to a Hebrew word here. When God says, I'll thin them out for you, that word literally is where we get the word for refine. It's the idea of refining a metal to get out the impurities. You are going to come to times in your life where God is going to do a refining. And you're going to feel powerless. And you're going to feel like you can't control things. And you're going to feel like you wish something would happen differently. You're, you're going to even try with your own strength to say, this is not the way I want it to be. I mean, if it was up to me, I would choose the biggest people to go in with me, and I'd have all of them go with me. And God's like, no, no, no. I'm giving you very few resources to show that it's me that's helping you to make it. Corey Ten Boone said this, hold everything in your hands lightly, otherwise it hurts when God pries your fingers open. Here's three questions for today for this point. Do I trust God with all areas of my life? Is there any area right now where you're saying to God, I, this isn't fair, this isn't right, God's against me. Why didn't he just give me what I wanted right here? Why didn't he just work things out for me? God, I'm going to trust you with this area. Number two, confess any area. Just be honest with God. You know, confession is just being honest. By the way, when you're honest with God, he doesn't go, what? I had no idea. Right? Confess any area and ask God to help you trust him. You know, sometimes we don't trust him and we confess it and then we still don't trust him. So it's okay to say to God, I'm having a hard time trusting you. And then finally, specifically release your security to God. Your life is in his hands. Listen, I'm very aware because I've lost friends, that you can be driving and lose your life. One of my friends was hit by somebody going 120 miles an hour this last weekend. They're, they're okay. They were sideswiped. One little change, one little thing. And you can be impacted by other people in life. So no, God, my life is in your hand. Every day, every moment. So every day, every moment, I trust you, God. All right, number two. Oh, let me, here's some first steps to set priorities. I'm going to do these pretty quick. Pray about your goals. Walk through them mentally, just like I did. Okay, how am I going to redo this thing? Okay, this is what I'm going to do. So how am I going to have a quiet time? This is what I'm going to do. How am I going to get up and spend time in prayer? This is what I'm going to do. How am I going to get up and exercise? Maybe you hadn't thought about that one yet. All right, this is what I'm going to do. Decide what's most important and make a list. Okay, to make a list, let me give you a little secret. You can text yourself. Did you know that? If you didn't know that yet, you need to do that. I do that with grocery lists all the time. It's a little weird because you text yourself and then your phone dings and then you start to wonder who just texted me. <laughs> Number three, take a small step, the hardest task. So any step, the thing that you really don't want to do, do something small. Let's say you want to clean out a whole pantry. Well, instead of deciding the whole pantry, just say I'm going to straighten up my chicken soups. Small step. If you want to start exercising, say I'm going to do one push-up. By the way, that's awesome to do one push-up and then go, victory! It's a great moment. Number four, chunk similar tasks when possible. So one of the reasons I study on Wednesday morning and Friday morning is to put all that study together. Because if I have appointments and then study and then appointments and then study, it makes it more difficult to get back into the task I'm doing. Number five, prepare the night before. Put your shoes out, put your Bible out, whatever it is you're going to do next. Be ready. Number six, reward yourself when you succeed. Now, that doesn't mean you have to give yourself chocolate every time, all right? But you can just pat yourself on the back. You can give yourself a high five. I know that sounds weird, but they've actually found that people just going, I did it. It helps them to want to do it again. It's really, we're weird people. Number seven, try again when you fail. Any, anybody need a further illustration of my idiocy? Anyone? No? Carl, you got it down? Carl loved when I cut down the tree and it hit the power line just barely. I said, see, success. Number eight, prioritize godly goals first. We tend to prioritize everything else first. Put the godly goals first, put everything else second, and you'll fit them in. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. Number two, when difficult obedience leads to blessing. 
Jesus in John 14 said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning, middle of the watch. Just after they had changed the guard, they, listen to this, this is their plan. They blew the trumpets and then broke the jars that had the, that had the torch in them, right? The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed their jars, grasping the torches in their left hand and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. So... You have now gone up on an enemy camp, enemies who had slingshots. And now at night, you had a fire over your head in darkness. Have you thought through that? That is terrifying. Like, I want to show who I am. Oh, and if you can't see me, I'm right here. Right? That's what I would have thought. And I would have been one of the first ones to go home. I'm just saying that would have happened. Reed would have stayed, but I would have been gone, right? I would have been like, Reed, have a good time. Let me know when God works it out. It's not easy to be obedient. I have a friend named Brett Freeman. I told this story last night. He was an engineer uh, for Boeing. And he one of the head engineers and moving up in his corporation. And he was praying one day and he felt like God was calling him to missions. He came and went to seminary with me. Took seminary classes in Orlando. New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. And I met Brett and I was talking to him. And he said, I got to take four classes in order to be a missionary. He and his wife left and went to Nepal. They had a 10 by 10 box to put all their things in. Think about today, if you had to decide 10 by 10. Some of you have storage closets that are bigger than 10 by 10. Imagine 10 by 10 wooden box. And I said, well, what are they doing that for? Because they carry it over the mountain with an elephant. I'm like, you're kidding. He's like, no, no. They went to Nepal. When they got there, their son got sick and almost died right away. Their kids were still teenagers at that time. I remember Brett telling me the story of the first time they, they wanted to get some meat. There wasn't a lot of meat. They were eating rice and beans and rice and beans and rice and beans. They wanted to have some chicken. So they said, where do we get chicken? They said, you got to go to that lady. So they went over to the lady and they said, hey, we need some chicken. And so she said, hang on just a second. She went over. She grabbed a chicken. Went like this and said, here's a chicken. And Donna went, I got to figure out what to do with this chicken. And so she learned how to pluck and skin and do all the stuff to a chicken. We don't even see that. What do we do? We go to the store and... We buy the chicken breast, and we don't even like it if there's anything there. They even have to put a little thing so that we don't even see blood, right? We're such wimps. I remember when uh, Campbell's Soup came to Nepal, they were like, wow. In Nepal, he taught computers at a university that did not even have consistent power. They did that for over 25 years. After last night, I went home and I thought, I wonder if I could get in touch with Brett. And I looked it up, and he's now working at a church in Tennessee, and I sent him an email this morning. I said, I don't know if you remember me, but I've been telling your story all weekend. A guy who gave up everything and said, I feel like this is what God wants me to do. And so that's what he did. He could have had an easy, comfortable life, but he said, this is what God wants me to do. Is there anything uncomfortable that God has asked you to do? Here's three questions. Is there any area where I'm not obeying God? Confess it and ask God to help you obey. And then finally, write down an area where you want to obey God. Finally, number three. So we talk about security and expectations. Show us our priorities. Difficult obedience and blessing. That's our priorities. And then finally, as we join with others to gain victory. When I first became a Christian, I was a senior in high school. Gave my life to Christ. Went to Westminster Christian School in Miami. Walked the, or talked the talk, but didn't walk the walk until right before my senior year. Right after my senior year, my youth pastor came to me and said, hey, I think it'd be important for you to grow in, in, with a group of other guys. And so I'd like you to meet me at the office. I said, okay, what time are we meet? And he said, 6 a.m. Senior in high school, 6 a.m. That was not a time. I didn't know there were two sixes on the clock, right? <laughs> but every Thursday, I got up at 5 o'clock in the morning, got ready, drove across Miami to go and meet with a group of about six guys. Wasn't even a great Bible study. Can I be honest with you? But those are the guys who began to inspire me, to encourage me. You need people around you. When the 300 trumpets sounded, verse 22, the Lord caused the men through the camp to turn on each other with their swords. The army fled to all these great long-named places. Israelites from Naphtali, Asher, and all of Manasseh were called out. By the way, those are names of Joseph's brothers, right? And they pursued the Midianites. So what happened? 
as they went, those guys were getting tired. So they said, everybody else come help. So now God said, hey, you get other people now. Why? I've taken you through that time of difficulty. Now I'm going to bring others around you to help me. That's how God works every time. You will sometimes go through a valley of darkness by yourself and feel very alone. No one understands. But as you pass through that valley in obedience, God will send people alongside of you to walk with you as you come out of the valley into the light. Gideon sent messengers, come down against the Midianites, seize the waters of the Jordan ahead of them as far as Bethbara. So all the men of Ephraim were called out. They seized the waters of the Jordan as far as Bethbara. What'd they do? They had victory together. Listen, don't do the Christian life by yourself. Jesus called us to make disciples. Making disciples means that you have to know somebody else. I don't care if it's one person, two persons, three people, a small group you're in, but you need to get with a group of people every week and discuss God's word. Discuss what God's doing in your life. Maybe you do soap like I did with a lot of men over the years. S for scripture. We talk about scripture. O for outreach. Who you reaching out to? A for accountability. How you doing in treating others? And then P for prayer. We prayed for each other. We did that every week for years. Get with a group of people who can encourage you. Am I helping anyone to grow like Christ? Confess that God can use you to help others to grow. That's a different kind of confession. It's confessing that you can be used by God. Would you repeat after me? I can be used by God. Ready? One, two, three. Pretty good. Pretty good. Now, you have to just believe that now. And then write down someone you can connect with weekly. You don't have to be a deep theologian. You can text somebody and say, I was reading this Bible verse. I think it means this. That's okay. You can call somebody. I know, that's new. That's like an app on your phone where you can talk to somebody's voice. And you can say, how you doing? I was praying for you today. Begin to connect with a few people in your life spiritually. Why? Because you're doing all these other things. I'm not saying they're not important. But these are the most important things. The most important thing you can do is surrender your life to Christ. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him, that means put their faith in. It doesn't mean just knowing about whoever puts their faith in him will not perish. They won't die. This death is a closing your eyes here and opening your eyes in heaven. They won't perish, but they'll have eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He didn't say there's many paths to God. He didn't say just be a nice person. He didn't say make your good outweigh your bad. He said, I'm the way to God. So if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your boss, if you've never trusted him to save you, then you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to trust him. If you're watching online, you can email me or text me, send me a voicemail. You can call our office. My secretary will get me in touch with you. I'd love to talk to you about what it means. But I want to encourage you, don't stop where you're at. Prioritize your Christian walk. Take those next steps. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for all that you have done and all that you're doing. Lord, I thank you for visions and dreams that you give us, things to remind us that you're with us, that you walk with us. Help us to never forget what you have told us. And Lord, when we go through dark times and difficult times, I pray that your light would continue to burn in our hearts. 